Moenta Roses, Autumn, by Fairy Tale Lover, Chapter 18. Tywin looked at the ocean spread endlessly outside his window. He was not the sort of man given to useless contemplations, but if he had one guilty pleasure, it was to watch the water break at the surf. His son's raven lay on his desk, a new source of concern. But he went on calculating, as he ever did. Legacy. It was what he had preached from the beginning. For when people he was still trying to rid of their family name from his father's stupidity and weakness. People die. Legacy remains. He thought. He turned around to gaze at his second and a last guilty pleasure. A luxurious painting of Joanna. His beloved Joanna. One of the few flights of fancy he allowed himself. He is indeed his mother's son, Joanna, he said out loud, as if conversing with his dead wife. Unpredictable and too sure of himself. But he is a Lannister, my love. Our very own grandson. I cannot allow his disgrace. Raven from King's Landing, my lord. The maester announced and delivered the message before leaving just as quickly. Dear Lord Lannister, I regret to inform you that, although we have been able to camouflage his smaller misdeeds, Prince Joffrey has done two big controversial things at once. First, as he mentioned his desire, I gifted him one of my finest girls. Before I could help in covering it up, servants found the girl beaten and bleeding in his room. She came to die later on the day, and we know how strongly our king feels in this regard. Then he brutishly had one of his guards attack Sansa Stark before the whole court. If he had attacked anyone else, there might have been a chance. But he attacked Lord Stark's daughter, and there will be no reprieve. The king is furious, with both misdeeds and will demand his disinheritance. I will work with Sir Jamie to have Prince Joffrey sent to you before the trial, but I fear I will certainly fail. Your servant, Lord Peter Baelish. Oh, the plot thickens. Tywin mumbled to himself. He wished he knew more, but although Lord Baelish had fit way too much already into such a raven skull given his small print, the parchment was only so big. He had received reports, even from Caban, that Robert was losing his patience with Joffrey's whims. It seemed that waking up to the news that his son had beaten a whore to death, and later on the day had his best friend's daughter beaten up, the daughter of a great house. Joffrey has made his own bed, Joanna. Not even I can save him, not without looking weak. This is not a war worth fighting, because we have no ground to stand on. How can I call our house offended, when it was Joffrey that offended the hand of the king's daughter? How can I blame Ned Stark for his outrage, when one of the reasons I had resigned the handship was because Ares belittled our beloved daughter? However much I hate Lord Stark, I must concede that he is right. But our legacy, our legacy must prevail. And if Joffrey is unfit, if he has become a liability, then it is time to invest in Tommen. He drummed his fingers on the arm of his chair. That notwithstanding, Ned Stark is an annoyance that must be removed. Oh, but this is wonderful, actually. Tywin smiled. We can turn this to our great advantage, Joanna. Losing Joffrey will be worth it if I can turn it to our profit. All I have to do is make sure Joffrey will do what is right when the time comes. And Stafford is there. He can run interference. He picked up parchment and quill to compose a message. There was still a way to salvage Joffrey's crown. Though that was not his priority. Their family's honour and get rid of Ned Stark. All in one simple move. And he would not let it pass him by. Sansa looked at her reflection in the mirror. Her hair was an absolute disaster, but there was no helping it after seven days abed. How long do you think before my little sibling is born? She asked Ella, who was brushing her long locks. Not long, I hope. 
About a moon, I think. There was a knock on the door, and Catelyn stopped putting together Sansa's clothes, and allowed Adam in, though she didn't seem too pleased to do so. I've got you something, he said, coming to kneel before Sansa as she sat on the bench. You'll need to recover before you can learn how to use it. But by then, I'll probably be gone up north, so I thought I'd give it now. He offered her the thin box and helped Sansa open it. She still had one hand wrapped in bandages and in a sling. She gasped. Ella smiled softly and Catelyn snorted. Is she to learn how to swing a sword as well? The redhead asked with a sneer. If she wants to, I'd be delighted to teach her. Adam answered. But you aren't your sister, Sansa. And that's not the sort of thing you like. There's nothing wrong with having a hidden dagger. And using it, if you must protect yourself, though. She will have guards for that, Catelyn said. She had a guard three days ago, Ella said. It didn't help much. I doubt a Lord Dane will enjoy hearing about his betrothed handling a blade, Catelyn insisted. There is a huge difference between daggers and swords. You know that, don't you? Ella provoked. This is only for emergencies, Sansa. Adam cut through their bickering. Lady Alaria also has one. But she said she knew you didn't. And there were too many guards for her to get you both free. So, if you were worried about that, you know Lord Dane is not a hypocrite. He wouldn't forbid you from something he allows his aunt, who grew up as a sister to him, to do. Sansa looked at the blade remembering the maelstrom of emotions that had gone through her that day in the throne room. How Alaria had indeed tried to get them out, but it had been too chaotic. Where would I carry it? she asked, fingering the dagger. People will see it in my dress. Adam chuckled. No, they won't. Did you see it in Alaria's? But Ella took Sansa's hand and raised it to the folds of her dress, over her expanded waistline. The girl gasped as she felt the volume and was shocked as she pulled a dagger out. In almost three years, did you ever see it in any of my dresses? Ella asked softly. No, Sansa said in a whisper. Then she returned her stepmother's dagger and turned to Adam. How do I use it, Uncle? The throne room was filled to the limit. All of the nobles in King's Landing and those who had been able to make the journey in so little time, converging there. It had been first brought to a moment of shocked silence, and then rose to excited gossip, when Stannis walked in after three years away from court. Now it was once again being brought to silence as people opened the way. Ned and Ella were leading the group, but it was Sansa's appearance at the doors that had halted the whispers into a sophistical silence. To Catelyn's dislike, and even Ned's discomfort, the girl had insisted on attending and not hiding her injuries. Her eye was a bit swollen, and still purplish from the slap she had received, her lip barely healed, and her arm still in its sling. The steps down into the room would be painful on her ribs, but she had insisted to take them, showing that she had some stark stubbornness as well. The first one almost made her lose her balance, but then a hand was offered to her, and Sansa looked up to see Edric smiling at her, offering support. She knew the gesture was more than kindness to help her. It would also show that, despite Joffrey's actions, they were unwavering. So, with an understanding smile, she took his hand and leaned heavily on him to take the remaining steps. Ned led the way to the front of the room, though he remained with his family, rather than taking his position to the right of the throne. Once the whispers began to rise again, they were inflamed as Joffrey was escorted into the room by his guard. Three king's guards, two Stark men, one Dane and one Tyrell. Ned was still anxious. Though he had drafted the decree of disinheritance and Robert had signed it the day before, the court had been called by the king's wishes and no one outside the small council knew about it. He wouldn't believe it until Robert sat upon the Iron Throne, 
and declared it before the audience. At this point, if Robert wavered, Ned was prepared to petition in front of the whole court to have Joffrey sent to the wall, and damn the consequences. It seemed that the time it took for the king to arrive was endless. Robert crossed the room unseen, only looking at the others once he had taken his seat on the throne. Seeing Stannis was intriguing, to say the least. Since his brother had simply vanished with no cause, and reappeared just as suddenly. But it was seeing Ned standing in the gallery, away from him, away from the throne, that got to him. Ned was making a statement that, in this case, he was not going to act or react from his position as Hand of the King, but as Lord Stark of Winterfell, ready to defend his daughter's honour, by leaving if need be. It was a controversial, unpopular, and troublesome move that he was about to do, unseat his eldest son. Even if Joffrey, at fifteen name days old, hadn't been officially named the Crown Prince, that was a mere formality. A party supposed to be held on his sixteenth name day to celebrate his official majority. Pomp and circumstance. To set him aside, regardless of good reason, would be an insult to Casterly Rock and there would be consequences to that, even if Tommen was to become the next in line. He signalled for the Herald to call for attention, though. It was time to get this over and done with. From the gallery, sitting with the rest of the small council, minus the Lord Hand, Lord Baelish was sitting back and observing. He was calm, because he knew the probable outcome. Tywin Lannister's plan which he had received and managed to pass along to Joffrey, was sound and well thought out, as befit the Lord of Castle Rock. And it was so simple, because it was the expected reaction from all parties involved. The only way it wouldn't work was if Joffrey messed it up. And that little thing knew Tywin had already accounted for. We are gathered here, Robert started. Because of the sorry excuse of a spectacle my eldest son put on seven days ago. Grand Maester Pycelle, if you would read the charges. Prince Joffrey of Houses Lannister and Baratheon, Pycelle started in his wheezy voice. You stand here, accused of beating the whole Rowana to death. Are we to cry over whores now? Joffrey mocked loudly. Don't make matters worse. Jamie snapped quietly. Wait for your turn to speak. Joffrey snorted but acquiesced. You are accused of commanding your guard to kill Cayenne, a guard of House Stark, without provocation. The Grand Maester continued. You are accused of commanding your guard to kill Alaric, a guard of House Tyrell, also without provocation. You are accused of undue violence against the Lady Alaria of House Dane. You are accused of holding the Lady Marjorie Tyrell of House Stark against her will, and you are accused of the brutal humiliation and unprovoked attack on Lady Sansa of House Stark. How do you plead, Your Grace? This is... Joffrey started. My king! Stafford Lannister called and stepped forward. Certainly to accuse the Crown Prince of such grave accusations. Our Master of Laws. Robert called. What do you think of Joffrey's title at this very moment? It is true that this is considered mere formality, Renly said, standing up. But the law is clear when it states that the eldest son of a king is only officially and rightfully considered and titled Crown Prince upon his 16th name day, age in which he is legally capable of ruling in his own name. Before that, the crown is merely expectation but Jamie saw that he was trying to appeal to bureaucracy and fancy words would get them nowhere. Besides, Joffrey was too impulsive. Too much like Cersei. He didn't have the temper to listen and think before speaking, like Tywin and Tyrion did. The boy was bound to say something else to irritate people. Best hold this now. His hand twitched on the, his pommel as he lowered his voice to Joffrey again. What your grandfather told you to do, do it now. 
he said. Joffrey looked at the sword as well and swallowed. Father, he called, and the court came to silence once more. You accuse me of all this nonsense, minor and unimportant business, Joffrey said, and Jamie thought about elbowing him hard enough to make him bite his foolish tongue. He was putting his own head in the noose. However, to prove that this is indeed stupid, and that I am your rightful heir, I demand a trial by combat. Court rose in agitation again. Ella felt her heart tighten. Anyone with a brain knew who Joffrey was going to appoint as his champion, and she knew what Ned's response was going to be. It didn't help when Adam stepped forward from his position next to John. I can beat him, he said quietly. You are good, I know, but I can beat him. So the choice was to be between her husband and her brother. Ella was very unhappy. She is my daughter, Ned said just as quietly. Yes, and you've got her, another one, five sons and one more child on the way, all of whom need you. It's a stupid risk to take. Ella saw Ned's jaws set and knew that it was a lost argument. So it is to be father against father, she thought. Her brother was sung praises as the best swordsman there was and Ned had been able to disarm him once, the one time they had fought in single combat. So there was hope. And he would spend the next few days in hard training. She would make sure of it. You have a duty, Ned said in a nearly inaudible voice. If I lose, you are to be much more important. He can't get up there. You'll be the only one to protect him. Before their argument could be continued, though, Robert called for order. Everyone in the room had arrived at the same conclusion. As it was so painfully obvious, even before Joffrey announced it, a satisfied smirk on his face. I name my uncle, Sir Jamie Lannister, as my champion. And I will fight for my daughter's honour, Ned said, stepping forward as well. Robert looked from one to the other, dread setting in. A trial by combat was a guaranteed right for a thousand years. Something that had come with the Andals even before the Targaryens had suffered their reptilian madness upon these shores. So he couldn't forbid it, without a good enough reason, or court would rise in chaotic argument. It was a fact that it didn't necessarily have to be a fight to the death. But once two men were fighting with swords, who knows what could happen? My king! Stannis rose his voice, stepping forward, and cut through the noise. I ask to make a point if I may prevail upon the court. Ned's relationship with Stannis had always been difficult, but if anyone would know of a fucking law or honourable deed to unmake this mess, he would. I should be glad to hear you, brother, the king said, though his smile was fake. What we have here are multiple crimes. It is Prince Joffrey's right to demand a trial by combat, of course, and our laws must be upheld. But we have different types of crimes. For the crimes of murder, of the girl and the two guards, the prince might name his champion from one of the king's guard, as he is part of the royal family. And as Sir Jamie is a king's guard, everything follows the law. The crime against Lady Sansa, however, was a crime against the honour of an innocent maiden, the daughter of a great house. Our laws prescribe two ways of dealing with this issue. The first, to satisfy her honour, he must marry her with her lord father's consent. I deny my consent, Ned said, without even pausing to think. He would never subject Sansa to Joffrey's whims, even if that meant she would be regarded as dishonoured. Though, by Edric's reaction, the way he stood by Sansa and held her hand at this very moment, he didn't think as much. Therefore, we are left with the second option. Stannis continued, and there was a hint of a shadow of a smile on his sour lips. Since each one of us is responsible, and must answer for our own honour, when the crime is against honour, the accused must not name a champion, but must fight himself. Unless the accuser is a woman, and so that party might name a champion to fight in her name. Especially, as it is the case if said party suffers from injuries occurred by the other. Therefore, 
For the crime against Lady Sansa, Prince Joffrey must fight himself. Voices rose in agitation again, and Ella exhaled in relief. She remembered Arya's tale of what had happened at the crossroads, and she knew Joffrey never went into the training yard. Even twenty years his senior, Ned would easily put him on his back. Jamie cursed, not caring that people heard, and Joffrey went deeply pale. Sitting with the small council, Littlefinger was astonished. That made him no difference. Though he had expected Robert would figure out a way to prevent Ned Stark from fighting Jamie Lannister. He had certainly not expected this outcome. Oh, but this was bound to cause chaos. A valid point, brother. Robert said after calling for order again. And, as you said, our law must be upheld without a show of favouritism. Joffrey called for a trial by combat, and so he will have one. However, since he is a boy, I think it unfair to have him face a veteran of wars, a celebrated hero. Lady Sansa might choose a champion from among her brothers, who has not won any military honours. Daenerys breathed, relieved as well. Though the relief came mixed with guilt. As a knight named by the king himself, and a winner of two tourneys, even if the first had been an honourable deed, John had just been discarded by the oath. She knew he would have volunteered, saying that Rob was heir to the north and more valuable than him. But now he couldn't. Bran was all the way in Winterfell, Rickon was a boy of seven, and Craigon was barely learning to walk. The answer was also painfully obvious. Pity for Joffrey, Arya said. I won't mind if you name me, Sansa. Don't be silly, Arya, Ned said. Absolutely not, Catelyn exclaimed vehemently. If she names a girl, she's qualifying herself to fight, and that is what the Lannisters will say. Ella said, I would still put my money on Sansa, Arya shrugged. Hells, I think Cragen could beat the blonde fool. Her three parents didn't share her amusement. Sansa looked up, and Rob nodded. I'm sorry, she said. I'm not, he replied with a smile. I can't wait to break his face in half. Hey, I beat him before I had any proper training, Arya said laughing. Rob will finish him in one single move. I name my eldest brother, Lord Rob, Sansa announced. I accept the challenge, your grace, Rob said, though Marjorie painfully dug her nails into his arm in anxiety. Very well, Robert said. The trial is set for three days from now. Though, before we go, we have one more order of business. Lord Renly, as our master of laws, read my latest decree to the gathered court. By the grace and command of his grace, King Robert of House Baratheon, first of his name, King of the Andals, the Roynar and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm, it is hereby decreed the immediate disinheritance and exile from the capital of Joffrey of House Baratheon, eldest son of his grace and his lawful wife, Queen Cersei of House Lannister. In this manner, the next in line to the throne is now Prince Tommen of House Baratheon. Don't react, Jaime said, trying to hold Joffrey back as the room rose in uproar again. Your uncle is right, Stafford said coming on the boy's other side. Win the trial first, and then you will have the god's will on your side to challenge the decree. Now, you will only make the king angrier. Before Joffrey could react, Robert had already dismissed the court and stomped out of the room. Ned led his family out as well, and Jamie put a sound on Joffrey's shoulder. Come on, we have three days to make a night out of you. They had barely reached the tower when Adam called Rob. Training begins now. The knight said. Rob didn't complain. First, because cockiness was the easiest way to be defeated, and second, because he would never turn down a sparring session with Arthur Dane. Obviously, everyone sat around to watch. Even the Tyrells came to offer their support and join the audience, anxious to see the skill of Marjorie's new husband. Want to start easy and escalate all the other way around? Adam asked, going for the blunted swords. Easy and escalate. Rob decided. 
Then let's start with what we all expect Joffrey's skill to be. Adam said with a smile. I'm sure Kragen is still taking his mid-morning nap, uncle. Ari adjusted. Regon, you're up. Adam called laughing. Hey, please, uncle. Don't offend Rickon. Arya exclaimed. Everyone laughed, but the boy was more than eager. And though it was visible that Rob didn't put his best foot forward, it didn't take him more than a moment to disarm Rickon, who only laughed, bowed at accepting defeat, and rushed back to Catelyn, who praised him. Next up was Theon. The match was more balanced, obviously, but Rob also triumphed with grace. Jory was next, then Benjen, the hardest so far. And by the time John picked up the training sword, Rob was pounding. Tired already, brother? Still escalating, brother. Rob laughed and attacked. John chuckled as he parried, and they were locked in a skilled and entrancing dance. Several moments went by without a clear winner shown, when Adam picked up a wooden sword and went to the side of side cross from John and surprised Rob, succeeding in tripping him and putting him on his back. That was a low trick! Catelyn exclaimed. The rest were only shocked, though Ella rolled her eyes. She had seen this enough times. It was, Adam agreed, giving his hand to help Rob up. I like to believe that, since he was trained by Sir Arthur Dane, and has been a King's Guard all this time. There is some honour to Jamie Lannister. He will spend the next three days trying to mold Joffrey into a fighter. Whether or not he will succeed remains to be seen. But you're a fool if you think there won't be a long line of Lannister sympathisers thinking up a thousand tricks to help the former princeling. And despite of Jamie's potential honour, Joffrey has already shown he has none. He will try to win even using low tricks. Forget the argument and the King's fury to come. You'll be dead by then. You need to be more than your sword. Be the whole space around you. Rob nodded and he and John got into position again. It took a quarter of an hour or more for Rob to finally get distracted and lose his footing. My turn, Ned said, coming to take the sword from John. Give me one moment, Rob said, panting for breath. Marjorie filled a horn with ale and brought it over, and Rob drained it gratefully. John took a seat next to Danny and smiled as Lyanna climbed into his lap. You are great, Papa. The last block got to you. Danny commented, testing John's arm. He grimaced. If he didn't lose his footing, I might have lost the next parry. You men are too stubborn and proud not to endure pain if it means winning. Danny huffed in annoyance. Who's stronger than me? John countered. Be you better, Papa. Papa is faster, Leah. Danny said. I see it, Mama. Papa is fast. Like Auntie Aya. John chuckled as Danny began a light massage, grateful for the relief it brought his sore muscles. Recovered, Rob got into position again, and he and Ned parried back and forth. I loved it when Father came down to the training yard. They were always the best days of the week. And when he and Sir Roderick sparred, I remember going to watch them even before I could start training myself, John said. A long moment of sparring passed until, finally, Ned managed to disarm him. Rob exhaled and then started to breathe deeply to recover his breath. Ned smiled, coming to hug him. I'm proud of you, son. Rob only smiled as Marjorie brought him a cup of the refreshing iced tea that had just been brought up from the hall. Sir Barristan and Lord Manderley came and joined the audience. I said you were good, Stark. Adam started, but you're a bit out of form. Still, Rob, you are not looking at the space around you. Your father nearly tripped you twice, but he decided not to. Joffrey doesn't have formal training, so he can't rely on parries and blocks. He will try to trick you to your back. Let the boy catch his breath then, Ned said. Let's have you against me. Adam smiled as Ella huffed. Children, she thought to herself. Now this'll be a match that's worth seeing, John said with anticipation. Something to go into the songs for sure, Barristan said quietly for him and Danny to hear. Why, Papa? Leanna asked, looking up. 
Because both Grandpa and Uncle Adam are very good with a sword, little love. It's fun to watch. The two men took their position and then the match started. After a complicated trance of sorts, they both took a step back. Not as rusty as you thought, am I? Ned provoked. You fought better, Adam said back and their swords crossed again. If you let them, they'll spend the whole afternoon at this. Benjamin turned to Wellas to say, though his eyes barely left the display of skill in front of him. And then they would spend the rest of the next 18 years provoking each other, blaming another woman screaming for their interrupted brawl. Alice said, let them vent, it will do them some good. The sparring took another pause. You fought better as well, Ned said panting. Well, age comes to us all. Adam replied, Aren't you done measuring your egos? Ella called out. Not quite yet, sister. Unless your husband is afraid of the truth. Ned rolled his eyes. Perhaps you're the one who is afraid. Blunt metal sung out against blunt metal as they retook the match. Finally, Adam began to gain advantage. He spent at least two hours on the training yard every day, while Ned had a desk job. And in a complicated twirl and parry, Ned's sword fell away from him. I told you, Stark. You are rusty. You need to get out of your solar more often. Aye, I suspect you're right, Ned conceded. We're even now, though. And your rematch can wait another 18 years, Ella said, standing back up. Rob is supposed to be the one training, big brother. You are right, little sister. Come on, Rob, you've had your rest. You have a rest, Sir Adam, Barristan called from behind Annie. I would like to see how Lord Rob faces me. Rob smiled. It is a great honour to spar with you, Sir Barristan. Rob is seeing several boyhood dreams come true today. John whispered into Danny's ear, and she chuckled. You see one of your boyhood dreams every day, and you go down to the training yard with him. She said, let your brother have his turn. John only smiled and turned to kiss her temple. Adam and Barristan had efficiently taken up Rob's training. Though, what worried Ned was, like the knight had said, not skill, but trickery. You should go and get this off your chest, Alice said. This room is filled with skilled swordsmen. Rob will be fine. She pointed with her head to where Barristan gave instructions as Rob and Garland sparred. I'll be back soon, he said, then set a hand over her bump as he kissed her forehead. Standing up, he smiled and ruffled Silver's fur as the direwolf came to sit next to Ella. Benjamin watched him leave with a worried expression. Knowing my brother, that is going to be an explosive conversation. It's been coming for 18 years, Ella said quietly. Ned stayed quiet because of Leanna's death, and he's been swallowing down a lot lately. But he won't take this one. Think he's going to resign? Benjamin asked, his voice covered by the japing men spiring. No, Ella stated, though not for Robert's sake. And he might just say that to his grace's face. The king's guards had either been warned of his arrival, or Ned's face was sufficiently stormy that they opened the door fast enough that he didn't even pause. Are you drunk yet? Ned asked as soon as he saw Robert sitting on his chair, nursing his faithful companion, his cup. Nod yet, the king replied. Are you going to lecture me on drinking again? No. But I very much intend to have you remember this conversation, so I can't have you drunk for it, he snapped, pacing the room in with manic energy. What else could I do, Ned? Not put my heir at risk, the northerner exclaimed. Was it a trade? A compensation? Payback? My eldest son for yours? Lady Sansa did the choosing, Robert said inside his cup, draining it. Oh, is that what you're telling yourself? That it was Sansa's choice? You know what you were doing, Robert. You chose Rob. You made it so she could only name Rob or herself. Should she have chosen the youngest of the Catlins? He's what, five? Or what about the baby? I couldn't use the argument that I couldn't let you fight because you were a celebrated warrior 
and not apply to John. He defeated the bloody mountain in single combat. People would have said I'd have condemned Joffrey right there. If you think I would have been any less mad if you had allowed the choice to be between Rob and John, then you obviously don't know me. Ned snapped and the king recoiled as if he'd been hit over the head with something heavy. Rob doesn't have anything to worry about, Robert said, wounded. The only reason Joffrey knows which end the point is and which end the pommel is is because he can differentiate steel from gold and that bloody lion's head glitters on his hip. I should be the one fighting, Ned insisted. I was protecting you, Robert yelled, standing up. Damn you! What did you want me to do? Would you and the Kingslayer fighting each other and think that was the greatest fight I'd seen in a while? Ned snorted, sneering coldly. It is visible, then, that you truly don't care about your family. Because you could disapprove of Joffrey's actions, disinherit him for the good of the realm, but still love your son. You don't know what loving your child is like. It's clear to me now. I would die a thousand deaths before I allowed harm any of my children. I would lie and kill and throw my name and my honour to the wind if it meant protecting my family. And I pity you that you don't care about anyone enough to do so. But know this, Robert, as much as it hair on if as much as a hair on my son's head is harmed because you were trying to protect me, I'll never forgive you. A trial by combat doesn't need to be to the death. The king mumbled, disarmed by the coldness of his friend's tone. Tell Joffrey that, because after what he did to Daenerys, when I'd opened my home to him, the way he insulted me, what he did to Sansa in front of everyone, I know he has no honour. If he uses low tricks to win, I'll kill him myself and fuck the war that will start with Casterly Rock. Let Tywin start what he might want. I don't need to worry about that. Robert waved it off. You never worry about anything, Robert! Ned exclaimed in frustration. And honestly, I find I have nothing else to say. It wouldn't matter anyway. Ned, wait, don't go! Robert called as Ned turned to make his way out of the room. Don't worry, your grace. I'm not leaving. Ned replied, turning back to his king. That man had once been his best friend. A boy he admired. There was nothing left of that boy in the man standing before him. If there ever was. Lyanna had been right all along. Love is sweet, dearest Ned, but it cannot change a man. But it cannot change a man's nature. The boy Ned had grown up with at the Ewing would have been incapable of this. The boy he had loved like a brother like he had loved Brandon or Benjamin. Clearly, if he had ever existed, he was long gone. But Ned was finally done in making excuses. Though I'm not staying because of you. I'm staying because someone needs to save this realm from you. And unfortunately, no one else has the guts to tell you the truth to your face. With that, Ned left the room and slammed the door behind himself. Robert sat back on his chair, dejected and disheartened. He thought he was saving his friend. In the end, he had lost that friend. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that one. Oh, dramatic, but the next one's going to be even more so. I love the whole thing with them all coming together in the courtyard and fighting. And the fact that, like, jeez, I think Ned needed to get that off his chest for a long time. Anyway, you guys know the drill. Like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night, or whatever time's in your own. Bye, my guys, gals, and I'll buy my pals. I'll see you in another video. Take care.